don't we get started? Um, where we got to for lecture one was um, we looked at sort of the basics for amino acids and started to, to talk about how you control the folding of proteins. And so far, the, the, the main rule that we have uh, at the moment is that if, you, if you're hydrophobic, you're in that hydrophobic group of amino acids, you're going to tend to occupy the interior. Let's pretend we're dealing with a, a, a globular protein, okay? And then on the surface, that's where the charged groups go, that's where the polar groups go, and that's also um, uh, the uh, places where if you have random coils, there's no secondary structure, you want to usually find them on the, the surface as well. Now, why does that make sense? Why would you put your random coil on the surface of that globular structure instead of burying it in the hydrophobic core? You should be able to answer that since you now you know why why do we have secondary structures? It's actually that's part of the, the answer. So if you, if you have no secondary structure, why are you going to put that on the surface? Well, you said it last time, the um, secondary structure is um, a hydrogen bonds between the backbone, and if you have a polar backbone, the hydrogen bonds are going to hide the polarity from the non-polar molecules. Right. So, so the corollary to that is, so if secondary structures allow the polar backbone to go through a hydrophobic area, then if you have no secondary structures, they can't. So they need to be on the surface. So that's that's the answer. Is there's no way for the random coil to protect to, to form hydrogen bonds to, to tie those polar groups of the, the peptide backbone core together. Okay, so that's why you're going to find them on the surface. Okay. Now a couple of things um, we talked about different classes of amino acids, but there are a few what we call special amino acids, and they are uh, these three right here. They all happen to be in a hydrophobic group, okay? And so you use these in particular places, so it doesn't really always confirm to that rule that I just talked about, well, it's going to be on the surface or it's going to be in the core. It depends what the protein actually looks like. For example, uh, for glycine, glycine is extremely small. What's the R group on glycine? It's a hydrogen. The proton, right? So that's a really tiny group, and so if you need to fit in uh, that R group into a very small place, then that's a good uh, R group to choose. Uh, secondly, if you uh, have to bend the protein very quickly, okay, you want to change the direction rapidly, then oftentimes what you'll find is a proline, because a proline R group actually puts a kink into the backbone of the of the peptide. So let's look at those two examples. And our third one, uh, which we'll also cover, is cysteine. What do you do with cysteine? Well, we, we know they, they form uh, disulfide bridges, but let's look at that visually. Okay, so here's a good example of a place where you, you need to, to pack things in very tightly. So this is the uh, stuff that makes up collagen, lots of your connective tissue. Okay, and uh, collagen tends to form uh, this motif, which is a collagen triple helix. So it's a good example of a motif. Um, so the problem is getting these R groups to fit right in that little area where all three of those alpha helices touch one another. There's no room in there, right? So what you find are two different amino acids at high concentration that tend to be there in that particular part of the protein. <coughs> proline, for one thing, because you can make this thing bend very quickly. And number two is glycine, because it's very, the R group is just a proton, so it just fits right in there very easily. So you tend to find prolines and glycines in these tight spaces in the collagen triple helix. Okay, so that's a good example of using them in very special places. Okay. Um, what about disulfide bridges? Find an example of that. So here we go. So if you have cysteines, they can um, uh, interact in a couple different ways. They can either be uh, uh, reduced, that is, they're just a plain sulfhydro group. That's the sulfhydro group. Okay. This is where you find cyst you find cysteines in the reduced state in the cytoplasm. Okay. In the oxidized state, they form disulfide bridges. Okay. 
Where does this happen? Well, it happens in two main, main areas. It happens in the ER, inside the lumen of the ER, and everywhere inside of the secretory pathway that we're going to talk about uh, quite a bit. So what's the secretory pathway? It's inside the ER, inside the Golgi, inside secretory vesicles. And the last place where you find disulfide bridges is on the outside of the cell. So the exoplasmic compartment is considered to be oxidizing. The interior of the ER and the Golgi and secretory vesicles basically are the exoplasmic compartment, right? So that's oxidizing. So you're going to find uh, these disulfide bridges will form in the ER. That's because they're very stable. It's an oxidizing environment. And basically, if you're trying to take this protein and unfold it, like you're going to try to determine its molecular weight, you need to stand it up and string it out. Well, two things you have to do. You can put urea, which is going to tend to spread this out. It will unfold the protein. But you're going to have a problem with these. And I mentioned last time, I couldn't remember the name of the, of the chemical. It's beta mercaptoethanol uh, is what you use to break these bonds. Because you will not be able to string it out completely unless you break the disulfide bridges. OK. Um, you know, a good practical example of a protein where that's important uh, is actually insulin. insulin uh, is in the secretory pathway, so are those bridges going to be oxidized or reduced? What do you do with insulin? Where is it headed? So you have a beta cell in the pancreas, it's making insulin, what's it going to do with it? Eat it? No. Where is it headed? Yeah, it's going to the exoplasmic compartment. So, what do you suspect about the disulfide bridges? They're going to be oxidized. So they will be constructed, right? And so that construction actually starts in the ER. Those disulfide bridges uh, form. And then what happens is this is the precursor. And this precursor is there. It forms because uh, it makes the folding of insulin easier. But once you get the insulin molecule folded, what happens is when you get into the secretory vesicle <coughs> and it's waiting for a signal, what's the signal that the insulin secretory vesicle is waiting for? When do you secrete insulin? Yes. Yeah. Pardon me? Um, an abundance of glucose? Yeah, or after a meal or during a meal. In fact, it starts right away, right? So it's waiting for glucose, and so it's sitting there inside the secretory vesicle. Meanwhile, what's happening is an enzyme is cleaving it right there and right there, and so that's why insulin looks like a two-chain uh, protein when it's not. It's actually the precursor is a single polypeptide. So this, this has tertiary structure, but it has no quaternary structure. Okay. Okay. Good. I think that brings us to uh, the other lecture. Okay. And so we were, we were talking about different. So these um, secondary structures form uh, are probably the very first things that form during folding. Okay. And uh, actually, alpha helices form before beta sheets. I don't know why, but they're, they usually do. Okay. And so you need to know, obviously, the difference between these two, what are their characteristics? And so here's the question. Well, we haven't talked about uh, these loops, so let's let's do that. Let's go back to the outline, and because we kind of skipped through that. Not all loops are random coils. Okay. So here here's our discussion of secondary structures last time. So we talked about all this, but then uh, we did. I did mention that that certain loops are connected connect two different strands together. And you have a couple of different choices when you're connecting two anti-parallel um, um, anti beta strands. Um, typically, if it's they're anti-parallel, then you use a hairpin loop. And this one's a little bit redundant because a beta turn is just basically a very short hairpin loop. Okay, So it's up like three amino acids, four amino acids or less. <coughs> So these two loops, those are secondary structures. They're always in a very uh, predictable uh, conformation. And the third type of loop that is a secondary structure is called an omega loop. And it's sort of a, 
Uh, it's a very dubious, it's hard to say, just point out, oh, that's an omega loop. Uh, but t the characteristic that's most um, uh, probable or tends to characteristic their position is it has 6 to 16 amino acids that project out and they're very stable and they connect to uh, adjacent secondary elements. Now, the only protein you're ever going to have to know that has omega loops <coughs> is an immunoglobulin molecule. So that's going to be our poster child displaying uh, secondary of uh, these omega loops. Now, functionally, they're quite important. Let's take a look at, at one of these. So this is an immunoglobulin molecule, and these are, these are the omega loops here. I mean, again, they're not real recognizable, but they're called omega loops. But that's what actually recognizes the, the antigen. That's how your antibodies recognize a foreign substance or something uh, that it's binding to, is through those omega loops. Uh, and they're always going to be on the outside of the protein because they, they don't have, their, their backbone is not tied up. But they are considered secondary structures, so it sort of sort of breaks the definition. But um, they have enough structure that we consider them secondary structures. They're not random coils. Okay, so that's all enough immunology for today. Okay, so let's take a look at. Uh, I told you that you know you should be able to sort of write down the <coughs> structure of a protein, and a quick way to do that. Um, quick way to do that is. Uh, NCC, NCC, NCC. Now look at this diagram and see if you can tell which way the, these are uh, beta strands. Okay. And what you have, so this is a little lollipop in case you don't know what the, the, uh, uh, these different atoms are. That's an oxygen, so that's a carbonyl group. There's the nitrogen, so that little thing right there is the alpha carbon. So one way to to, to do this very quickly is find out where is the peptide bond, okay? And to do that very quickly, look at the little lollipop it's picking up, find the oxygen, okay? And the peptide bond is between it and the adjacent nitrogen, okay? So if this is the, the carbonyl, that's the nitrogen, which way is this, pro, this strand running? It's going down, isn't it? So now let's see. Let's try that rule again. Let's go over here. Let's look at this one. So this one's going down, okay. And so you would draw the arrow if you drew the strand. You put an arrow pointing down because the arrow is pointing in the way to get to the C terminus. So that means the N terminus would be up here somewhere. The C terminus is down this way, okay. But it's probably connected to this, all right. So this is going. Let's ask the question: Is this parallel or anti-parallel? So we'll look at our, so this is lollipop and the nitrogen. Yeah, that's the rule. It's going this way, so it is a parallel. So you could put, you could connect these two by a hairpin turn or a beta turn, right? A really short segment. Okay, now let's, let's do this one. Look over here, lollipop, nitrogen. It's going down. So this is anti-parallel to this guy, right? So that, again, you could use a hairpin turn up here and go down. Okay, now let's look here. Oops, which way is it going? <laughs> down. This one's parallel to this one. So if you're going to connect these two strands, this one's going down, right? So this, and this, so this is headed towards the C terminus. So you've got to get back up here because this is also pointing <laughs> down to the C terminus. So that means there's no way you can connect this to that using a hairpin turn. It has to be a long loop to do it. Okay, so learn to look at these kinds of diagrams, speed read them, it, it just takes a little practice. Figure out whether they're anti-parallel and ask yourself, what would you put to connect those two together? Okay, good. Any questions about that? This is one of the problems, and that's why I give the, in the problems book to give you some practice in dealing with this. You, you don't want to deal with this for the first time on an exam. And so you, you shouldn't have to if you've worked the problem. Okay, uh, let's look at a couple of uh, good examples of, of motifs. Again, so this is a, what's called a beta barrel. It's basically a beta sheet that's rolled up into a barrel-like structure. And we use these in our own cells as part of the outer mitochondrial membrane. So this actually creates 
a porin, okay, and a porin, so this is the outer mitochondrial membrane, so the inner mitochondrial membrane is down here somewhere. This is the cytoplasm, and this allows nutrients like pyruvate and other <coughs> ions to freely flow in, a, in, and, in and out of this place, right? So, because you don't want to, uh, you don't want to block pyruvate getting into the um, mitochondria because you're going to use it, right? You're going to oxidize that to, and, and create ATP. So you want that flow, but you don't want every big protein trying to get in here. So it excludes things that's that are less than like 5,000, I mean, uh, 5,000 Daltons. So it's a size exclusion. It's not very specific. So the pH of the of the Cytoplasm is the same as the pH of the intramembrane space because of these porins that are leaky. Protons can move in and out, right? Okay. So now, if you create a, a pore like this, then what would you suspect? So this is in the membrane. This is the outer mitochondrial membrane. So let's look at this beta strand right there. Let's say it's adjacent to the, it's right up next to the membrane, but yet it's part of this pore. So what are you going to predict about the amino acids that are facing this lipid content? What's, so it's hydrophobic. I'll give you that hint, right? So you would say that the amino acids on this beta strand that are touching this li the lipid part are going to be hydrophobic. But you can't put them all in a row, right? Because the R groups come out of a beta strand up and down up and down. So every other one would be hydrophobic. Okay, so one would be pointing in. The one that's facing the pore is going to have what property? Hydrophilic, because it's a fluid-filled pore, right? So if you're sophisticated about this, you know that a strand, that a beta strand that makes up a beta barrel is going to alternate between hydrophobic and hydrophilic. Hydrophobic, hydrophilic. And they're always perpendicular to the strand. Good. So that we can use this, these tools that we're assembling to build any protein that we're going to talk about. That's why it's so basic and important to understand this. Okay, um, we talked about this already. This is a good example of a, a, a motif. It's called coil coil. And the reason it has that name is it's two alpha helices, and each one, you know, alpha helix is basically a coil, isn't it? Well, then you're coiling the coils around each other, hence the term coil coil. Now, if this is, um, so, and then we talked a little bit, this is CSAR, uh, and it's actually, uh, this is lecture two PowerPoint, but we, we got into it last time. This is a single polypeptide. So there's the C terminus, this is the N terminus. So this thing is not going to have quaternary structure, is it? Because it's a single polypeptide. Okay. But it does have independent domains, right? We talked about motifs make up domains. Domains are a bigger thing than a motif. Okay. But it is possible for some very simple domains to have a single motif in them. Right? They, the domains have one or more. But the, the key thing is they're independently folded and usually they have an independent um, structure and function. Okay, so let's, let's look at an example and I'm going to draw it for you, is our poster child for uh, different types of domains. Okay. So this protein is, has two areas. Okay. This is the heavy chain of a molecule that's very important to athletes and all of us because this is myosin 2. And so it actually has two different domains. It has a tail domain and it has uh, a head domain. Okay, in that head domain, let's say we didn't know what the function is. We actually do know what the function is. But if you don't know the function of a protein, how do you name it? Well, you name it by what it looks like. So that's, that's a globular domain because, strangely enough, it looks like a glob. It's a circle. It's a ball. Okay. And this would be a fibrous domain. Fibrous domain. So those, we call those structural domains because we're not saying anything about their function. Okay, now let's put its binding partner, which would be an identical molecule. I'm going to draw it just a different color. And 
it, it looks like this. Okay. So now this fibrous domain, it consists of one motif. And that motif is a coil coil. Right? And we would expect amino acids to repeat every seven amino acids, and, and amino acid one and, and amino acid four should be hyperphobic because that's where those two coils are going to touch each other. Right? Now, we do know the function. So the, what's the function of the fibrous domain? Dimerization. That's its function. Dimerization. Okay. What's the function of the head group? Well, unless you know about the physiology, this is the part that splits ATP. So this is an ATPase. <coughs> so we, we can say that this is the motor domain. Because we actually know what its function is. It's going to split ATP, and this thing is going to walk. It's going to move along an active filament. And this is a motor protein. Okay, so if you don't know any information, you just you, you describe it as a function, as a structural domain, and then once you find out what it does, then you can go back and assign some more detail. Because, like for example, we talked about this uh, last time that we know, for example, that this is the ATP binding domain here, and that the where this is actually going to uh, th this is. CSARC, remember it's a kinase, so it's going to split ATP, it's going to take the phosphate group and stick it on another protein. Okay. All right. And so uh, this is the ATPA the binding domain, uh, this is the SH3 domain, and so what's its function? It binds to polyprolines. And they look really weird because they, they you know now that prolines put a little pickup in the, the background, so it's a very recognizing, recognizable bump. And that's what SH3 domains look for. They look for bumpy little proline-rich areas. And of course, this binds to phosphotyrosine. So that's its function. So, so we, we can now give that, that's a functional domain. It's, gonna, it's looking for a binding partner that has polyprolines. This is looking for a binding partner that has phosphotyrosine. And this would be these two come together. The active site for the, the kinase is actually between those two domains. So both of these together are going to put together a kinase domain. Okay. Good. All right. So let's uh, just a few more uh, typical motifs. This is considered a what's called a four helix bundle. We're going to run into a lot of proteins that have a four helix bundle. Okay. Uh, one of the most famous is actually uh, growth hormone. Growth hormone, when it gets into your uh, blood, folds into a four helix bundle. And that allows it to bind to its receptor on target tissues, such as skeletal muscle. What is this? Uh, this is it's called a Rothman, a Rossman fold, and it, bind, it looks for nucleic acids. So it's a nucleic acid motif, binding motif. Okay. And this one, this is an old friend of ours. This is, these are the omega loops, okay, up here. So this is the, the motif that constructs one of those arms of the immunoglobulin domain, all right? So this is the part that recognizes the antigens. But you have, what you have are uh, a series of anti-parallel beta sheets that create what's called a beta sandwich. You, can you see that? It's like two hands put together. And your fingers are like anti-parallel beta strands, and in between your fingers, it's like you just picked up some uh, spaghetti, and that's what those loops are, and they're recognizing the antigens. But what's actually holding them into position that creates the precise shape to recognize the antigen is that beta sandwich. Okay, and this the formal name for this. So this is a beta sandwich. That's a little bit informal. We would uh, call that a um, immunoglobulin fold. Okay. So we can do a lot of constructing if we assemble these <laughs> together in a protein in a particular domain and fold them. And then they have a variety of different functions. But we don't have to memorize all. There's about probably 55 different motifs. That's pretty amazing that out of 55 motifs we can make most of the known structures of proteins. 
Okay, and this is a along that same line. It, there's a the pr there's a principle that I want to make sure you understand. It's a really it's an important concept. Is the sequence of amino acids does not have to be identical for two things to share homology. Right? Really, for two things to be related, typically it's only 25% of the amino acids need to be the same as in the other protein. So we have two different, these are both uh, proteins that have a similar function, they cut other proteins, so they would be called proteases. Okay? But this one works in the lung, and this one works in your GI lumen. Okay? But they both cut proteins. And so we would expect their shapes to be fairly similar, and you can see that the green <coughs> residues are the only ones that are, the, are exactly the same as the ones over here. You notice there's a lot of gray residues there. Okay. But the key thing is positioning these little green ones in the right place gives it the, the same shape as that guy over there. You notice the shapes are very similar. In particular, there needs to be a lot of homology in the active site of that um, proteins, because that's where it binds its substrate and does its job. It clips the peptide backbone. Okay. And this is sort of the same story. But what we have is this is a protein uh, that's actually, so two very uh, widely separated uh, groups in evolution, yeast from Drosophila. So this is an animal, that's a fungi, right? Way apart. Okay. But this, you notice the motif here, this is actually a, what's called a helix turn helix motif. So that, that's an important one to remember. We're going to use that a lot. Uh, it's a motif that we use in transcription factors to bind the DNA. Okay. The, the helix turn helix is right here. Helix, turn, there's the turn. Uh, and then there is a, is that a beta turn? No, because these are not beta strands. These are two alpha helices, so we just call it the turn. Okay. But it's very short. All right, so we have helix, turn, helix. And this structure is going to position this little guy, this helix, so that it fits into the major groove of DNA and recognize it. Okay, so if you're going to be, DNA has not changed a lot from yeast to Drosophila. It's still the double helix, right? So this thing needs to be highly conserved in order to fit in the major groove of DNA. So it's going to have similarity. So you look at this, and the only residues in this area are the little black dots. There's very few. I think there are, uh, oh, I don't know, I forget the number, maybe 12 out of about 60. Okay? And so even just having those few groups similar gives both proteins this helix turn helix motif and allows it to bind the DNA. So that's the take home point. You don't have to have exactly the same residues as long as the shape is maintained. You'll tend to have a similar function. Okay, and so, and this is it's just doing its job. So these, that's that, that third helix, and you cut off, the, this is a cross section, and it's inserted into, this is obviously the major, that's the minor groove, major groove, sticks in there. And most transcription factors read the nucleotides using this, uh, an alpha helix to project in there. Okay, and we'll, we'll get back, we'll, we'll study this quite a bit here in a couple of lectures because we'll get into uh, transcription factors. So. All right, so this is a, a good example of the helix turn helix motif and shows the, the uh, necessity uh, to maintain structures even through evolution. If it's going to have this, a similar function, uh, you don't have it exactly uh, have to have exact sequence, but you need to have the same shape if you're going to have a similar function. Okay, so what makes our protein so complicated? Uh, what happens is it's not the case that we've invented a bunch of new domains and new motifs. What we tend to do, our proteins tend to be more complicated because we have, we've added several different domains to each protein and we've mixed and matched these. So here's a really simple epidermal growth factor uh, domain. Okay. And it is constructed of several mo uh, a couple of motifs. And here's chymotrypsin. And then we have, so that's EGF, that, that's growth factor. This is a, um, 
a protease, urokinase, it's still <coughs> split stuff. So what happens is you just to make this new enzyme, what you did was actually this is urokinase, so this is a, a, a phosphorylates things. You took the chymotrypsin domain and then you added the EGF domain, you have a new protein. So to get more complicated <coughs> proteins, what you do is you steal domains from other genes and recombine them. And it's a good idea to take a whole domain. They usually correspond to exons. You don't want half an exon, right? Because you'd have half a domain. It would screw up the folding. So if you take, if you have shuffling of exons, and this is actually called uh, exon shuffling, is a way of building a, a, a new protein with a new function by recombining domains you already have. And that tends to be why our proteins if you have a similar protein, here's yeast, worm, and I forget what this is. I think the figure will tell you. This is figure uh, 319. But look at the human's version of it. The reason ours is so much more complicated is because we combine more motifs and domains to make a new protein. It still has similar functions because it's got that core. But we've added some extra stuff to it to make it more complicated. And usually what that means is we can... This, this is not always the case, but one reason to add all this other stuff is to increase the regulation over that protein. Maybe we've added a domain that gets phosphorylated. Maybe we've added a, con, uh, a kinase domain that phosphorylates other things. Or maybe we've added something that allows it to bind to the, the plasma membrane. Okay. More complicated by getting recombining old uh, domains. Okay, um, now this is a protein that most of you should be familiar with. This is hemoglobin, okay? And let's just sort of remind ourselves. So, so this is obviously, it has uh, two different alpha uh, subunits and two different beta subunits. Each one of those subunits has a heme group that binds iron. And what does the iron bind to? Oxygen. Okay, so that's how hemoglobin carries oxygen. And so this protein, this has tertiary structure, but the overall protein is consider, it's considered one protein, so it has quaternary structure. And how would you name this? So there's four subunits, so it's a tetramer. And are all those sub, the subunits similar? So they're not, so it's not a homo tetramer, it's a hetero tetramer. So that that nomenclature is in your outline, so just become uh, comfortable with using it. That's the main reason I show this slide. Okay, oh, and so this is um, a particular type of protein because it's got a mixture of protein and then something else. It has this heme group in it and actually it allows it to bind metal, so we would call this a metalloprotein. It's a metal binding protein. Okay. And there's a difference. So the, the nomenclature there is if there is no other groups on it besides the, the, the protein backbone and its R groups, then that's called a simple protein. And if it's conjugated to something like this uh, heme group on an iron or it's phosphorylated or it has a lipid group, then we call it a conjugated protein. So now we can construct uh, a concept map of all the stuff that we've talked about fairly quickly. So we'll we'll go from the simple to to the top to the complex. So we have primary structures. as good as it's going to get. <coughs> yeah, okay. Primary structures fold into secondary structures. Okay. Secondary structures fold into motifs. And now you know a number of examples of that. Motifs then assemble into independently folded domains. Okay. And those domains are used to construct a single polypeptide, 
which has tertiary structure. And then, of course, you can take a single polypeptide and assemble it into uh, multiple subunits, like hemoglobin. Okay. And therefore, it would have quaternary structure. And then there's two flavors of this guy. You can have simple, or you can have um, conjugated. And the conjugated, of course, there's various categories. It could be a, a metalloprotein. It could be a lipo, lipoprotein. And on and on and on. And then you can combine all kinds of proteins together to form a multi-protein complex. And the book has a slightly different terminology, but it, you'll recognize it. Okay, and a good example of that would be like a ribosome. Ribosome's huge. It's got all kinds of proteins. What kind of conjugated proteins does a ribosome have? Anybody have a five chemistry now? The thing that actually catalyzes the, the formation of a peptide bond on a ribosome is not an enzyme. It's a ribosome. So it must be conjugated with nucleic acid, so we call it a nuclear protein. Right? But it's got all kinds of protein stuck together. And another good example is pyruvate dehydrogenase inside the mitochondrial matrix. It's, it's a massive three separate areas, and it's, it's, it's almost as big as a ribosome. OK. Anyway, so we'll run into lots and lots of examples of that sort of thing. OK, any questions about this hierarchy and how it fits together? Yeah. Um, on the uh, simple versus conjugated yeah. protein, if you have um, modified amino acids like methylated amino acid, would that then cause the protein to be conjugated, or would that be considered simple? No, that would still it would be uh, conjugated because okay. you're adding a non-protein moiety to it. Yeah, and conjugated is a, sort of another. It, it doesn't have to be covalent. If somehow the protein's holding on to iron, you know, uh, by itself. So let's let's think of a, uh, something that binds an ion by itself, calmodulin. And sometimes uh, there's no covalent bond between the calcium and the protein. So it doesn't have to be a, a, a covalent bond in order to be conjugated. It, it could be, be ionic. It's just something weird. Non-protein is stuck to it. Okay, very tightly. Okay, good. Uh, and that's a pretty good time for a break. Let's take a break there. Okay, why don't we get started again? So, now that we know a little bit of the basics about proteins, one of the things that we really need to get under our belt is some uh, specifics about a particular class of, of proteins that are very important, and that's enzymes. And um, there's, so there's four different questions that we need to ask ourselves uh, when we're trying to figure out how enzymes do their job. And one is how do cellular reactions, why do cellular reactions require enzymes? How do enzymes catalyze reactions? How do, what's the mechanism? Uh, how do we quantify enzymatic reaction characteristics? Okay, so what do we measure when we um, measure enzyme function? And what does that tell us about the cell? Uh, and finally, how are those enzymes regulated? Okay. All right, so let's answer the first question, is why do we need enzymes? And the answer is actually cell conditions are very mild. All right, so let me give you an example of what mild means. <clears throat> so we have a, a typical reaction would be um, peptide bond hydrolysis. We want to break the backbone. Okay. And we could have used any of those proteases, uh, elastase or chymotrypsin, to do that. Uh, so why do we need chymotrypsin and elastase to do that? Well, so, in the or so let's compare it to the organic chem lab. All of us have fond memories of that. And, and then there's inside the cell. Okay. So in organic chemistry lab, you, have to, you use temperature to speed up the reaction. So you boil it. 
100 degrees C. What's the temperature inside the cell? 30, inside us, it should be around 37 degrees C. So we have a third of the temperature. Um, you catalyze this in the organic chem with six molar hydrochloric acid. That's the catalyst. That's nasty, okay? Inside us, our acidity is 10 to the seventh molar because our pH is seven, right? So mild, mild, okay? And then this takes 24 hours. You let it sit there in the tube and you come back the next day. Here, this takes one second. Um, and so one of the reasons that we need these enzymes is because the conditions are so mild and also we can't afford to wait around to say digest a protein in our GI tract for 24 hours we would feel pretty sick if we did that. We Speed is of the essence as well. Okay. Now there's, um, we, there's lots of enzymes. So there's about 4,000 different enzymes that we know about. And that's just a rough estimate. Why do we need so many of them? Why do we need so many enzymes? Why not have, you know, they're just sort of make a, an elastase chymotryptase <laughs> and stick them together and have the same protein work in the GI lumen as you do in your lung epithelium. We could do that. What's the problem? Yeah. You don't need them to do the exact same thing in each different part of the body. Like well, that, that's actually a really good point because, so uh, his answer was, you know, you don't need those, in, they don't operate in the same conditions, right? So let's say you have <coughs> a pepsin that breaks peptide bonds mm -hmm. in the, uh, your stomach. What's the pH there? Two. And so that's not going to operate the same way as a lastase that's working at a pH of 7 or whatever. So they, have, they work in very specific areas, and they work on very specific reactions. So the, the, the basic answer, though, is the reason we need 4,000 enzymes is we need to catalyze 4,000 different reactions. You need one per reaction. And so the way you control each of the... So if you... If you had the same enzyme controlling several different reactions, you couldn't control those reactions independently unless you could manipulate the substrate concentrations. And the cell doesn't do that. It doesn't use substrate as its main regulator. It uses enzyme activity as its main regulator of reaction rate. Because you know, concentrations in, of, of uh, reactants and products, that's, that's a hard game to play. Okay, it's much better to have an enzyme turned on or turned off. Okay. And we'll talk about, that brings us back to our last question, which is how are enzymes <coughs> regulated? So that's an important question. Okay, so we have a couple of other things that we have to answer before we get to that. And so another reason um, that we need enzymes to begin with is because of what they do. All right, so let's take a look at what they do to reaction. And most of you have seen this story before. So we'll spend a lot of time on it. Um, all right, so we know that enzymes have to be specific. So that means the shape of the enzyme and its substrate need to have a really uh, strong match. Okay, they're very specific for each other. And the reason that's true is because the bonds that form uh, between A and D here are actually fairly weak bonds, particularly if this is an enzyme. So the only way you're going to hold A and D together tightly if you have a bunch of weak bonds is to have a lot of them. And so those weak bonds are not going to form unless the surface of A matches the surface of D. Hence the very uh, exquisite specificity of most enzymes. Now, do all enzymes have the same specificity? No. Some enzymes can recognize the difference between stereoisomers. Other enzymes are kind of sloppy, like chymotrypsin. It'll chop any protein as long as it's going from the C terminus. Okay, so uh, specificity is relative, but this is the reason we need the specificity, so that the shapes stick together very, very tightly. Okay. 
All right, and so here's a basic, this is actually a full, uh, it's still a simple equation, but it's, it's, it's complicated very fast. You have the substrate and the enzyme, they react um, and form an enzyme substrate complex, and then catalysis happens in this step here, and you form the enzyme product, and then the, the enzyme releases the product, regenerating itself, and so now you have the product and the enzyme. Uh, one of the things that's wrong with this, anybody know that what's wrong with this equation? It's actually still too simple. Well, what happens when you build up a lot of this stuff? What's going to happen to that reaction? And why would it slow down? You're going to have a back reaction, right? So all of these steps are reversible. Okay. In fact, this right here, this reaction, this is the on rate, but there's also an off rate. So there's a association constant and there's a dissociation constant. So, so sometimes the enzyme, the substrate and the enzyme bind, but sometimes they, they dissociate. And so the, the higher the affinity, uh, the stronger the association rate constant is to the dissociation. And we're going to talk about those rates constant. But this is still, so you put all those negatives, the, the back reactions, and you try to do the math, you've got like 10 or 12 differential equations to solve the concentration of, uh, of that um, product that's being formed. So that's pretty, that's too complicated. Um, and so we're going to make some assumptions and shrink this down in complexity to a much uh, more basic uh, type of reaction. Okay, but before we get that, let's... Let's look at what's going on here. So here's an uncatalyzed reaction. And you notice this is energetically favorable. So this is energy versus the progress of the reaction. Okay? And so this is substrate. This is a transition state where it's sort of halfway in between um, substrate and product. And so you have to get over this big energy hump in order to make it down here. Now, is this a thermodynamic? So without the enzyme, is this thermodynamically feasible without the enzyme. In other words, if we had eternity to wait, would it happen? Oh, yeah. yeah, it would. Because it's, and so we call that a metastable state, a metastable state, because the free energy is higher here than it is in the product. So it's energetically favorable to go downhill. The problem is you've got this big hump to get over to get there. To reach this transition state, you've got to distort the bonds, or it has to become reactive, or you know, it just—it's not just going to happen uh, very fast. So, thermodynamics does not ask how fast this goes; it, it answers the question, "Will it occur?" Okay. Now, what what do we do with the enzyme to get the increase in speed? Well, what we do is you bind to the enzyme, and it drops down the free energy a little bit in this case, uh, but then you got to get up to the transition state bound to the enzyme, and look, it's just a little blip. So again, the main way that enzymes catalyze reactions is that they lower the activation energy required to get to the transition state. Okay. And then it falls down, and it ends up at the same energy level as the uncatalyzed reaction. But it's occurring much faster. And it catalyzes the reverse reaction to the same extent. Does that mean the reverse and the forward reactions are similar? No, the forward reaction is, is much faster. They have independent rates, but the enzyme will catalyze both reactions. It's just slower going back the other direction. Because look, look at what it has to do to get up here. And then it goes down that way. Okay, so we can increase the kinetics independent of the thermodynamics. But what an enzyme can't do is if the product is up here and the substrate's down here, it can't make an energetically disfavorable reaction occur. It can't break the thermodynamics. It'll never occur. Okay. Now, mechanisms. So we're not going to get into the real detailed chemistry. Uh, I'll, I'll leave you to go to uh, biochemistry to figure that stuff out. But basically, here are the three things that, that enzymes do. That the enzyme is the green thing. So we call this the, um, the hot dog model of enzyme catalysis. And so the, this is the enzyme. And so changing the orientation between two reactants, these are, this is a, a two-reactant system, 
um, produces an enhancement of the reaction rate. So if you can break things and put them in the proper orientation, you can speed up the reaction. Okay. So orientation. Uh, the second is changing the activity of the, substrate, of the substrate. So what it does here, it actually adds or withdraws electrons or increases or decreases the pH inside of this binding pocket. So it makes the substrate more reactive than it was before. Okay, so it adds uh, or changes the uh, electronegativity on the, the substrate, which drives it to the transition state. And then finally, the uh, enzyme, when it binds to the, the substrate, can actually squeeze and distort the bonds in the um, substrate, causing them to break or to change. So uh, straining, it, um, bond strain induced by the enzyme, oftentimes the enzyme will bind to the, the substrate and then it will, it will actually change its shape and squeeze it. So that's called the induced fit model. So straining the bonds, making them more active, or orienting them, are those the three basic mechanisms by which you accelerate the reaction. Okay. Not a lot of detail here. Okay. Now, um, let's go to the outline and see where we are. So we've talked about um, most of these issues, but let's remind ourselves. I mentioned uh, ribozymes uh, a few minutes ago. Most biological catalysts are proteins, so they are enzymes. But don't get the idea that all biological catalysts are proteins. Some of them, are, in particular, are RNA, we call those ribozymes. So you can use RNA as a uh, reaction um, enhancer. Okay? Um, remember the terminology, an active site has two different functions. It's there for binding the substrate, and it's also there for uh, substrate activation, catalysis. Most of the time, those two places are very close together, but there are a few cases when they're a little far apart, and actually the enzyme has to change its shape to bring the substrate binding domain close to the substrate activation area. Okay. So that's one of those induced fit kind of models. Okay. So active site has two different functions. We've talked about the specificity. I alluded to uh, the temperature and pH optima. Every enzyme has its own pH that it likes to operate because those proton concentrations affect the reactivity of that enzyme because it affects the enzyme shape. That's why you can get away with having pepsin working in your stomach under pH 2, but if you took pepsin and put it into the bloodstream, which I hope you don't, um, it's not going to do anything because it's optimum. It's look, it needs a pH of 2 to do its job, and at pH 7 it would be non-functional. And vice versa with elastase. If you took, put elastase into the stomach, um, it would lose all of its activity. So it's got a, a pH optimum, and they've got temperature optimum. Now, that's real easy for us, right? Because we're, we're homeotherms, and so the, pH, the temperature optimum tends to be just one thing, 37. <coughs> but if you find an enzyme in a thermophilic bacterium in Yellowstone, you're going to expect a very different temperature optimum, aren't you? It's going to be up around boiling. Okay. And we talked about catalytic mechanisms. Now, I've shown you the, the, the full expression there, uh, which is the one I showed you, except it was missing all the, uh, the back reactions. Let's take a look at how we could make this possibly a little bit simpler. And so this is panel... Uh, zero three three in your book. Did everybody see that? Okay, so that big reaction we can actually simplify down to this reaction. This is much more manageable. Okay, so all we have is uh, enzyme binding substrate, and the the rate at which it does that uh, is measured by a rate constant, K one. And let's understand what rate constants are. Rate constants are the number of times that thing happens per second. Okay. So if it's if it's this reaction occurs really well, so we have a high affinity enzyme, 
This is a large number because it can happen several million times a second, right? So the relationship between K and the speed of the reaction is uh, if K is big, it means it happens a lot, very fast. Because the units are just reciprocal seconds. So it's, it's the number of times these things hit each other and get together. Now, the reverse reaction can also occur. So this is the uh, rate constant for association. This is the rate, con this is the KD, the rate constant for uh, dissociation. And notice, if this number is large, what's that going to do to the speed of this reaction? It's going to slow it down, right? Because as fast as, as this can jump on to the enzyme, it's going to lose it because it has low affinity. So if K1 minus 1 is a low affinity enzyme, it's going to have a big K minus 1. But if it has a large, uh, has a high affinity, this is going to be much bigger than that thing. Okay, so the Ks kind of help you predict uh, what kind of enzyme and how good it is. Okay. All right, so these fight over it, and eventually you form um, a enzyme substrate um, complex. And then essentially the catalysis reaction is really we're referring to K2, but we, we give it a special name because this is the, the rate constant for how many times the enzyme makes a product per second. It's called the turnover number. Okay. So K-cat is the turnover number. And think of it as how many times per second that enzyme can do the difficult job of orienting, activating, smushing, crunching, formation of the steady state, um, I'm sorry, of the transition state. It's the hardest re reaction in this series. So guess what? This tends to be the slowest rate constant, which would make its size what? Just a big number? Magnitude. Big or small? Small. So let's get that relationship down. Rate constant, if it's big, it means it's fast. It happens lots of times per second. This is slow because this doesn't happen very many times per second, and so it tends to be a small number, particularly in relationship to either one of these two. Now, how did we get this easy, nice thing to work with? Because we can actually solve it and do something useful with it. Well, we made what's, what's called the initial rate assumption. And what we, what we mean by that is we're actually going to measure the formation of this guy, um, or the formation of the product, is fairly soon after we begin the reaction. So it's in the initial phase of the reaction. And if we do that, if we measure, uh, the limitations are how, what's the detection limit of our product? Can we, if we can measure at really small levels, then it's going to be a better initial rate uh, measurement. Okay, so we want to have a very exquisite way of measuring the product in the very early phases. Okay, and what that does is it means uh, a couple of different things. It means this actually will reach a steady state value that's unchanging at that early point in the reaction, and that's key for deriving this whole equation, which we're going to come up with. It's down here somewhere, and you can read the mathematics if you're uh, interested. Okay, but that's the initial rate uh, assumption is the concentration of this enzyme substrate um, combination is not changing. It's in a steady state. As much is coming in, there's as much being formed as is being converted into a product. So that's number one, what our initial rate uh, allows us to do. The second thing it allows us to do is there's no buildup of product. So that there's uh, not an appreciable return rate, okay? Reverse rate. That's why this is unidirectional. There's not a, we're measuring this so early that this hasn't built up to a level where it can be recognized by the enzyme and driven the, the opposite direction. Okay? So that allows us to use this simplified expression as representing the enzyme um, a reaction. But we have to do it at a very early stage in the reaction at the initial rate. Okay, if we do that, then we get, I guess, we'll, I think, let's use the, the notes for this. We did all the time. Oh, good. And I've, I've uh, 
written out all the details in your notes about what these things all mean and what the relationship of K's are. That's really important. Oh, yeah, the other thing that, that initial rate does is this third thing. The substrate concentration has not decreased to a level that it affects the, the forward rate of a reaction. So it's two things. You've got to have the product can't be there, and you can't have a, an appreciable loss of substrate. So this has to be fairly soon after you start the reaction. Okay, so what happens is we can actually now calculate the rate with this equation, and this is called the mccabe smithson equation. And so it's V max times the substrate concentration uh, divided by the Km, which is the Michaelis constant. Uh, I don't know what ha happened to Minton in that, but anyway, it's the Michaelis constant and then plus the substrate concentration. So this is the michaelis minton uh, equation. Now, when we solve this, what are we after? Because we know what the substrate concentration is because we put it into the test tube. And we know how much enzyme we put into the test tube. But each one of these constants means something. Okay? Uh, and so let's think of what the Vmax is. And this is pretty obvious. It's the maximum rate uh, reaction rate, maximum rate of velocity of this reaction. Okay? It can't go any faster. Okay? Um, and it actually has two different components. Uh, let's see, do I have the, or do I have to draw it for you? Yeah, there we go. So the V max is actually equal to the total enzyme concentration that you put in your test tube okay, times the K cap. That is the turnover number for that reaction. And that makes sense, doesn't it? Because this, this is the slowest rate determining step. So the reaction can't go any faster than that poor enzyme can chug through and grab the substrate and then convert it to product. Okay, so the reaction maximal speed is if every enzyme is doing its job and it's going at the fastest rate possible, which is still pretty slow compared to K1 and K-1, this is going to equal the fastest you can produce the product. That makes it intuitively, it should make sense to you. Okay. Now, the other number is um, the KM, and we define that operationally as the substrate concentration <coughs> at which V is half maximal. Okay. And we draw it like this. Let's see, do I have let's let's do it visually. Okay. And so if you have uh, this is the initial velocity and this is not time, this is substrate time because you're in control of that, right? Okay. And so this is, if this is, uh, follows michaelis minton kinetics, and not all enzymes do this, so it's a big if. So, but if it follows michaelis minton kinetics, it's going to look like this. It's going to be a, what's called a square hyperbola. Okay. And it reaches some asymptotic value. It, it approaches it, can never reach it. And that's the Vmax. Okay. That's the level that's called the Vmax. And so if we take the Vmax, and that's over here on the y-axis, and we go down halfway, so that's the rate at which the reaction is half maximal. But it's what is the substrate concentration at which this rate is equal to this? And so to find that, you just draw a horizontal over here, and then drop a vertical down. That's the Km. So it's the concentration of substrate, because it's on the x-axis, at which the rate is half maximal. So you can plot this thing out and just grab those two different um, constants, the Vmax and the Km, and derive it. Okay. So what is this Km thing? We, we know that the, the, the Vmax tells us something about the enzyme concentration, doesn't it? Because it's total, the enzyme's total concentration, and it tells us something about the turnover rate for X, each individual enzyme. So we can, if we know the the the, the V max, and we know how much enzyme we put into the tube, we can calculate the turnover number for every single protein that's doing its job. So that's you get a lot of information from the V max. 
What about the Km? So mathematically, the Km is very simple. It equals K minus 1 over K minus 2, K plus 1. Plus, sorry, I'll get it right. K1. So now notice this is flipped. It's the minus reaction over the forward reaction of association. It's just the enzyme binding to the substrate. We're just forming the enzyme substrate complex plus this guy, K cap. So what happens is if this is a small number, and we, we said it was, and most for most enzymes, K cat is a small number because it's the slowest step. If this is really small, we can actually mathematically just forget about it if it's small compared to these two. And when under those conditions where K cat is really slow, because it's really hard to get up to the transition state, then these two actually uh, become the inverse of the affinity of that enzyme for its substrate. Because basically this is the off rate, this is how fast it, it drops the, let's go with the substrate, and the bottom one is how many times it picks it up. Right? So if the Km is small, that means this number, it means this, this number is small, it means it has a high affinity. Because as this becomes smaller, what does it mean? It means this is becoming larger, the, the denominator is becoming larger than the numerator. And what's the denominator? It's the on rate. But as this gets sloppy, as it, if it, as it increases, what, what that means is that the off reaction is starting to dominate that, that ratio. So the take home message is in most cases, when we can ignore the K cap, when it's small. The Km is uh, inversely proportional to the enzymes of K. That's the take home message. Small Km, high affinity. Large Km, sloppy affinity. So that's the, the, the uh, basic meaning that you need to take away from the Km. <coughs> Okay. Now, are there a few enzymes where you actually have to consider this? Absolutely. There's, there's not a lot, but there's a few. And I would have to tell you um, whether to take that into consideration. But the, the basic, the full equation includes the term KCAT in there. It's just, for most cases, we can ignore it. Any questions about this? Is there like a cutoff for when KCAT is... Uh, Normal, or if you can just cut it off, or it's just yeah. There's seconds. It's probably um, if it's less than five percent, it different people use different values for that. So. Oh. Yeah, because the, if the enzyme, they're they're almost called perfect enzymes. Their rate of catalysis is so fast. KCAT is huge, and it strongly affects the KM. And as you, you can see, if this was big, what would it do? It'd make the KM bigger. And so it wouldn't be because it's a sloppy enzyme, it would be because the K-cat's so hot. So why do cell biologists care about this? Well, we care about it because that's how you regulate reactions, is you control the enzyme. And so we got to know about the fundamental properties of the enzyme to understand how we control it. Okay. So it, we need to know how much of that enzyme is in the cell, right? And we can get that value from the Vmax. If the Vmax is, so we measure two different conditions, and the Vmax is much bigger over here than it is in this uh, situation over there, so you have a control and experimental, and the Vmax goes up, it's probably the, not the case that the enzyme's turnover number has changed, because if it's the same protein, correct? Let's say it's the same exact protein in both types of cells, but in one case the Vmax is large, in one case it's low, it's small. So your a, a very reasonable assumption would be the number amount of enzyme being induced has increased. So how do you get the amount of enzyme to go up? If you're in, if you're in a cell, how do you make it go up? What would you do? What's an enzyme made out of? Protein? Okay. 
how do you make proteins? Well, messenger <laughs> RNA is read by the ribosome. Okay, where does messenger <laughs> RNA come from? Yes. Yeah. So, one way to increase the enzyme level is to turn on the gene for that enzyme, right? And that is a way of regulating that enzyme. It's called enzymatic induction. So if you see a, an increase in Vmax, something has increased the amount of that protein. Now, does it have to be, is it only uh, transcriptional uh, regulation? Absolutely not. And we'll, when we come back next time, we'll, we'll talk about other ways of regulating enzymes. But there's, there's a reason we get these funny little numbers and then I took all this time to explain it to you. We will talk about this for the rest of the course. But it, you've got to get these basic fundamentals down. What is a rate constant? Is it, is it large when it's fast or is it large when it's small? You know, just these, so that you can just spit out this stuff. Okay. Exactly what should happen. You should click on it and then it should come up. Um, 